It was his intention to become an intellectual black Baptist preacher like Harvard Thurman. He often said it. But as one old preacher said, uh, man proposes and God disposes. <laughs> when that woman did not move on the bus that day, all of his plans just, uh, you know, went uh, haywire and he had to start all over again and think of himself as a leader of a protest movement. The one thing that frustrated the forces of evil was our being nonviolent. They didn't know what to do with us when we knelt down and prayed for them, you know. They didn't know what to do with, with uh, our singing a hymn. Many of us that were prepared to literally present our bodies uh, as instruments, to put our bodies, our very being, on the line. In a real sense, because we use the philosophy of nonviolence and Christian love, it tends to have a cleansing effect upon all of us, black and whites alike. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. believed that evil and injustice must be resisted wherever they exist. His method of resistance was his nonviolent ethic, and the roots of that ethic are found right here in the black church. This is Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, formerly pastored by Dr. King and his father. I am William D. Watley. I invite you to join me as we trace the roots and the development of that nonviolent ethic. Grandfather was a great preacher, Dr. A.D. Williams. He sat around his grandfather all the time. His mother was a church woman, and his father was a preacher. So King had uh, the advantage that many uh, Baptist ministers have. You see, we don't have any bishops, we don't have any, any episcopacy, but very often uh, fathers uh, see to it that their sons are guided into the ministry. And, uh, and, and so it, it gets to be a tradition in some families, and so it was in King's family. My sons always said, and I always accepted this in humility, deep humility, that, that as a father, I was their ideal as, as a preacher. And they saw in me all that encountered uh, uh, a committed, uh, a devoted preacher. Many persons don't realize that behind Martin Luther King Jr. is our deeper roots which, which were responsible for him. I mean, he just didn't come up, you know, out of nowhere, so to speak. There could not have been a Martin Luther King without the black church. I mean, Martin Luther King was the third generation of Baptist preachers who were well known from one end of the country to the other. They couldn't dismiss him as a kook, as they could have some unknown Baptist preacher. Uh, this was ML's boy. This was AD's boy. Uh, he came from good, solid Baptist stock. And so no matter what the government or the press or the FBI said about him, uh, there was a network of seven million people that knew who he was, that understood his language, that had heard that cadence before uh, and that responded to that message because it was a product of their religious experience. Many of us were able to defy the customs, to defy the traditions, to defy the local laws because of our teaching uh, that we had uh, gained uh, from the church. Uh, it is without a doubt, if it hadn't been for the Blight Church, uh, we wouldn't have been able to make it. Uh, without the Blight Church, the movement, the civil rights movement, and many of us would have been like birds without wings, really. This is Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia where Dr. King went for his undergraduate education. It was here that he was first introduced to Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, which stated that unjust laws must be resisted. It was here that he made a decision to enter the ministry. Morehouse College has a tradition 
of producing men who take a stand against injustice. He had the ideas of protests. He had the Gandhian notion in his mind. Uh, he had the civil rights uh, spirit. Uh, any Morehouse man would have had those things, you know. You inherit that just the air you breathe, and Morehouse would say that to you. But he was not a part of the radical ranks. He was a part of the intellectual, uh, a Ph.D. in philosophy of religion. I mean, uh, that, that hardly corresponds, you know, with, uh, you know, the radical uh, protest spirit. After Dr. King's formal theological education, he received his first call to pastor Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery was King's appointment with destiny. But that appointment began as a pastor, responsible for a flock of people. Destiny caught up with him when a small woman on a bus, Mrs. Rosa Parks, refused to give up her seat to a white man. Her arrest for that action led to the start of the Montgomery bus boycott. His colleague and friend, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, was also a pastor in Montgomery during that period. We had to keep the people motivated in the mass meetings every evening. We, we would both speak in the mass meetings, and my job was to keep the people off of the buses. His job was to define the meaning and the philosophy of nonviolence. While in seminary, Dr. King had become familiar with Mahatma Gandhi's works. King saw a strong connection with Jesus' call to love everyone, including one's enemies, and the Gandhian nonviolent philosophy. It was a love that could disarm one's enemies and defeat the oppressor, just as Gandhi had done in defeating the British in India. I don't think he saw a great difference between uh, the teachings of, of the great teacher uh, and the teaching of, of Gandhi. Uh, he said, in a sense, Gandhi uh, provided us with maybe with the method uh, but Jesus Christ provided us with the philosophy. The Supreme Court ruling that segregated transportation was a violation of the law brought the Montgomery bus boycott to a victorious end. Montgomery demonstrated that nonviolence was successful as a tactic. It was a creative approach that allowed black people to get to work and keep their dignity by refusing to support a segregated transit system. Nonviolence demonstrated the economic clout of the black community and showed the nation that Southern blacks were ready to speak and act against injustice. I was impressed that anybody could get 50,000 black folk to do anything uh, together. Uh, but uh, he was not impressed with that. Uh, and uh, that's as it should be. We knew we had faith to believe that God would see us through. Um, that's the only way. That, that we could have made it. My brother even said himself that he knew that um, he faced uh, threats every day, almost every day of his life, but he was prepared to deal with it. When I got up to look around to see if I was in any danger, uh, I saw this light shining from under his bedroom door. So I knocked on the door and said, Mike, you there? Yes, yeah, Sam, come on in. I didn't want to disturb, you know, he was in bed with his wife, you know, so uh, I looked in there, Coretta was asleep, you know, on one edge of the bed, almost falling out. He was on this side of the bed, had a light on on the floor, reading, 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, man, are you crazy? What are you reading? He was reading Paul Tillich's Courage to Be, 3 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the bus boycott. You see, he fed his mind with that. He, he, he felt this anointing, but then he acted as though it had not taken place, and he prepared himself to, for battle because he knew he was in some very deep water. The Bull Connor and Sheriff Clark and, and, and Governor Wallace, he was in deep water, and he knew it, and he could have died any time. So he just prepared his mind, you know, to walk on the edge of existence like that, and uh, I admired him greatly for that. James H. Meredith is formally enrolled at the University of Mississippi, ending one chapter in the federal government's efforts to desegregate the university. The town of Oxford is an armed camp, following riots that accompany the registration of the first Negro in the university's 118-year history.
As the civil rights movement began to escalate in the South, violence was mounting. The freedom riders into the South were jailed. King was challenged about the extent of his own personal suffering and sacrifice. In 68, it was students acting spontaneously. In 55, it was Rosa Parks acting spontaneously. In 61, uh, the Freedom Rides, another spontaneous uh, event which he was called to respond to. He responded, but he didn't throw himself into it. And there were two reasons for that. One, I think that those were essentially student movements, uh, movements sponsored by the con uh, Congress of Racial Equality. And he was very sensitive about charges of coming in and taking over. Because whenever he went anywhere, no matter whose project it was, uh, the press turned to him. So he shied away from that kind of uh, visible leadership role and was very sensitive to his involvement in projects that essentially were being administered to other people. He went in, he spoke, but he got out as quickly as he could. Dr. King realized that jail could be an effective means for raising consciousness. Even more, he realized that jail would become a necessity for protesting against unjust laws. Nonviolent protest meant breaking those laws. Well, we went to jail 13 times during his lifetime together, and we discussed uh, various strategies. We always committed ourselves to nonviolence. We sought to purify ourselves by fasting and removing all evil spirits from our hearts. But we, through daily conversations and uh, daily readings of the scriptures in the, of the Bible, and we strategized and mapped a told strategy uh, because we were active people, always moving, always being involved, and this slowed us down and gave us an opportunity to be together once again and to sit down and talk and make some strategy. Just 100 years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves, 200,000 people converge on the nation's capital to rally for civil rights. Today's gathering is the largest in Washington's history. The men who organized the rally walk with springing steps toward the speaker stand. On the left, Roy Wilkins with A. Philip Randolph. They have fought their fight all of their adult lives. In the van is Martin Luther King, who has been jailed 12 times on racial issues. Along the way toward the passage of the landmark civil rights legislation was the massive rally held here in Washington, D.C., where Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. His gift of eloquence and his compelling vision of an integrated America captured the spirit of this nation. The speech went out over national television, and it showed King not simply as a protest leader, but as an articulate spokesman, one very much in the tradition of the black preacher who could move people to action. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? The March on Washington of 1963 was one of the finest moments, one of the finest hours of uh, the uh, civil rights movement. Uh, it was amazing, really, uh, on that uh, day in August to look out and see that sea of humanity, that crowd, uh, black and white, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, uh, all of us standing there together. Uh, for jobs and for freedom. Um, I was 23 years old. Um, to me, it was like the essence of the community, the essence of the beloved community. Because you had people there standing together in one mighty voice saying, uh, we want freedom and we want it now. Uh, saying to the Congress, saying to the President, 
pass a strong uh, civil rights bill. During the Selma campaign, Sheriff Jim Clark reacted with violence toward marches before a national television audience. While King was making preparations to resume the march against Clark and the Alabama state troopers, a federal injunction was imposed. The law through the Supreme Court and other federal courts had won the day for protest in Montgomery and other places. King realized, however, that the law could be used against the civil rights movement. Injunctions would be issued and a campaign would cease while a judge decided whether or not it would continue. King and his advisors decided that injunctions, even federal injunctions, might have to be disobeyed. The closest we came to challenging a federal injunction was in Selma. And uh, we were enjoined against marching from Selma to Montgomery after the beating on the bridge. But it was clear to us that because the injunction came from Frank Johnson, a judge who had been consistently fair, uh, that there had to be some solution other than our just marching and violating it. We decided to go back to him and appeal. Now they march under a federal court order and with the protection of federalized National Guard units and regular troops, a total of nearly 3,000 men. A country can't live without the rule of law. And uh, you might violate the law, but we always said that those violations were like uh, running through a red light when you're in an ambulance. Uh, you had to have red lights, and you couldn't just go because you didn't think a red light ought to be there. Uh, but on the occasions where some life was at stake, or there was a greater purpose, then it was you could transcend the law. President Johnson sends to Congress a bill to reinforce the right to vote. With Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach, the president signs an accompanying letter to the legislators urging swift passage for the bill that would outlaw discriminatory practices. During the Selma campaign, Congress voted on the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Although the civil rights movement had made significant social changes in a short period of time, and although King's strategy had proven effective, there were great debates within the movement about the efficacy of nonviolence. From time to time, uh, we did engage in some long discussion, heated debates about the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Uh, and there were some of my friends and, and colleagues who wanted to drop uh, nonviolence out of the name of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But if we want to have meaningful and lasting peace and tranquility in our society, uh, then you cannot use the methods and means of violence and hatred. You don't have to be a saint to understand that you could not fight to, you know, uh, Bull Connor and Sheriff Clark and Wallace with guns. You could not fight them with knives, you know. You couldn't fight them with a bunch of hoodlums from the city throwing Molotov cocktails at them. They had all the firepower they needed, you know. And when they used water hoses, they were mad because they would like to have used real guns, you know. But they were forced to use dogs and water hoses because they just couldn't go on killing people. So it turned out that nonviolence turned out to be not just a theological, an ideological thing, but a very practical kind of a strategy. And I regret very much that more young blacks didn't understand that. Five hours after the House passes the measure, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is signed at the White House by President Johnson. Doors were now legally open to America's black community that had never been opened before. But the doors of economic opportunity were still tightly shut. Six days of rioting in a Negro section of Los Angeles left behind scenes reminiscent of war-torn cities. It took the appearance of 14,000 troops to bring an end to what both Negro and white leaders called insurrection by hoodlums. Alleged dissatisfaction with the welfare system causes riots in the ghetto district of Boston's Roxbury section. Stores were smashed, burned, and looted in three nights of violence. Our analysis of the violence in the North was that it was frustration over continuing poverty uh, while whites in the society were moving forward and even blacks in the South were moving forward. And uh, Robert Kennedy made the remark one time that black leaders had neglected the North. Well, we were not 
I mean, we were Southern leaders. We had never lived or worked very much in the North, didn't know our way around too well. Uh, we knew the South, and we had responded to the situation in which we knew. But Martin decided that we had to go North, and the economic issue in Vietnam began to come together. Uh, he made the statement, the bombs you drop on Vietnam will explode at home. And I think he understood that to mean explode at home in the unemployment and inflation. Anti-war demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. Civil rights leader Martin Luther King leads the procession to the United Nations where he urges U.N. pressure to force the U.S. to stop bombing North Vietnam. This is Riverside Church in New York City. From this pulpit on April the 4th, 1967, Dr. King gave his most comprehensive and forceful speech explaining his opposition to the war in Vietnam. Now he was ready to apply his nonviolent methodology to the issues of international peace and economic justice. This speech further exacerbated already tense relations with the White House and alienated others from the civil rights movement. Black leaders had always felt that in order to be a part of this nation, we had to be super patriots. We fought to fought, fight in the wars when they wouldn't let us. We, we wanted them to know that we were American and, and, and perhaps we would be uh, rewarded for our, for our patriotism. The, the leaders said you don't mix civil rights and foreign policy. Isn't it interesting how today everybody seems to have been against Vietnam. <laughs> I wonder how we fought the war. <laughs> Nobody in favor of it, you know. Today, in retrospect, you know, everybody says that uh, it was an immoral and a wasteful thing to do. But uh, it took some courage at the time, and uh, the president was saying, we've never lost a war, we're not going to lose this one, all that sort of thing, you know, for someone to rise up and say we're wrong, and we ought to get out of there. Like so many prophets before him, King's opposition to war and economic injustices not only drew the wrath of disagreement and criticism, it also drew an assassin's bullet. On April the 4th, 1968, one year from the date of that historic and memorable speech, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was dead, killed while defending the rights of garbage workers in Memphis, Tennessee. We were discussing death I don't know how we came upon that topic, but uh, I said to him that I was afraid of death and afraid of dying. And he said to me, he said, well, I'm not um, if I felt that my death would free my people, then nothing would be sweeter. Thirty years ago, I was a barefooted boy, 15 years old, in uh, rural Alabama. Uh, I had no idea, had no idea that I w would one day be an elected official, that I would be a member of the city council. Uh, I was there very poor, just trying to survive. And I think in many parts of the South, uh, 30 years ago, we had very few, if any, uh, black elected officials. Uh, very few black people were registered to vote. We still had signs in this very building saying white and colored here at City Hall. You know, the South was not the Sun Belt before it was integrated. Uh, but the Sun's been down here. The difference was when we were pulling apart, uh, rather than pulling together, the region could not grow. Martin united us uh, in the South by helping us to find ways to reconcile our differences without destroying either person or property. And uh, that's an enormous legacy. I think it's quite appropriate that uh, he be honored because in a real way he did save our nation just as much as Lincoln or George Washington. But it's more significant that he was the only one of the three people honored by a national holiday that saved the nation without killing, without destroying either person or property. Martin Luther King Jr. has been called an American Gandhi, 
and Gandhi did influence him. But it was this institution, the black church, which was the womb which nurtured and inspired him and gave him impetus at critical moments in his life to risk his life, to use nonviolence, and to adopt nonviolence as a way of life. Dr. King's ultimate faith, however, was not in nonviolence, but in the power of God, a God who he learned to love and follow in this setting. I'm William D. Watley. The preceding program is based on the book, The Roots of Resistance, The Nonviolent Ethic of Martin Luther King, Jr. by William D. Watley. Available from your local bookstore or from Judson Bookstore, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Call 215-768-7091. 215-768-7091. Call 215-768-7091. 2091 215